Good evening. Hello. Hello. All right. So welcome everyone. This is our the second of our community meetings uh, for the housing study. And so I welcome you all here. Um, before we get started, um, this is also officially a planning board meeting. So I'm going to officially um, call to order the planning board and um, take roll um, of the planning board. And so I am John Christ. Um, I'm chair of the planning board. And I'll be kicking off the first part of this meeting. And I am present. Um, uh, Rebecca? I'm here. Um, Neil? Not here. Um, Phil um, cannot make it tonight. Mike? Yep. Um, Mark? Um, Susan? Here. And um, myself. And alternates, um, Zach, um, Michael Bouchard, Present. and Peter Julia. OK. Um, we will not be doing a review of minutes this evening, as we often do. We will <coughs> save those for another night. Um, so I do want to welcome you all to the um, second community meeting. Um, these are really important to this process where we get to get um, community impact um, or community um, outreach, I should say, and learn more from you all through various parts of this process, as we'll be talking a little bit more about in a moment, um, about our housing needs and preferences and other things that we'll be talking about a little bit later this evening. Um, a few things um, to realize uh, about this building. If you need to exit, um, if you go out these doors and through the hall over there on your left is an exit, right over there there's also a bathroom. Um, if you're looking for a water fountain, there's one right over here on the corner to the right, um, that are just outside this room here. Um, and um, if, you if you need materials, there's some on the table where you came in, you probably got some already. Um, there was a few materials being handed out. Um, otherwise, I will introduce the housing committee. Um, so the housing committee has been um, working pretty tirelessly, uh, meeting most weeks on Tuesday mornings and um, doing other work in between um, to get all this together. Um, so the housing committee includes um, a few of us from the planning board, including myself, uh, Mike Ahern, and Susan Wood, in addition to Patty Biederman, um, Brian Chalmers, Brian Eisenhower, um, Bruce Wiggett, um, and Matt Yetten. Um, and all of us are wearing name tags, as are the planning board members. Um, and Joseph Perez and June Hammond Rowan have also been um, working really hard with us um, to um, make all this happen. And I'll toss it off to Joseph in a moment. Um, and we've also been working through this whole process and owe oh, a tremendous amount of gratitude for all their hard work to Barrett Planning Group, um, including um, Judy Barrett, who is back there, um, Alexis, who is right here. You'll be hearing from him in a moment, as well as Will Downey, who is right over there. Um, <coughs> Tyler, not here tonight, right? Yeah, he uh, but he's also been working with us on parts of this project. Um, so with that, I think I will hand it over to Joseph um, from the planning department here in Plymouth. Um, and you can thank you all. Sure. So thank you all. I, uh, again, I really we appreciate all of your coming here tonight and, and participating in this, uh, this community forum. And thank you as well to everyone who attended the first one. This is, uh, this is great. It's so important. We really need to hear, you know, we really need to hear from all of you. So. Um, thank you again. Tonight we're going to start with a presentation from our consultants, Barrett Planning Group. Um, they're going to introduce the project, the process that they've been undertaking for this past several months. Um, and then they're going to talk a little bit about the community engagement that's happened so far, what's been learned, what we've heard uh, from previous conversations and what we're continuing to hear as well as the recent survey. Um, they'll also give an overview of the basics of the zoning ordinance here in Plymouth, so what we have for regulations that impact these topics, and they'll also give some overview of different terms, uh, frequently asked questions about these topics because there are a lot of terms and um, you know it's important to sort of go over those. So at the end there will also be a uh, you know discussion of next steps. It's 
kind of an open house format tonight, a little bit different from the previous meeting. Uh, once the presentation wraps up, there'll be an opportunity to sort of go between stations and there will certainly be instructions for that later on. Um, but it'll be more casual, uh, the opportunity to participate, give engagement, and then there will be some discussion at the end, and then a sort of coming back in here for a wrap up. Um, but you know, on the way out, there's also an activity to to do. So make sure that if you do leave before the end, there's there's still that activity on the door. So uh, you don't want to miss that. Um, and with that, I think I'll pass it over to Alexis from Barrett Planning to, to take on the next step. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thanks, Joseph and, and John, for introducing the meeting. Um, as Joseph said, my name is Alexis Lantalata. Um I'm with Barrett Planning Group. Um, my colleagues uh, Judy in the back there and uh, Will are also here this evening. Um, and when we get to the station part of the evening, uh, I'll make sure that everybody on the committee also gives you a wave so you have um, some faces and you know who's going to be at each station, um, which will be primarily the committee, some planning board, um, and us, the consultants. So I'm going to get, go over a little bit of what this project is. So can I, just a show of hands, who was at the first community meeting in April? OK. So for a handful of you, there will be some repeat information here. Just bear with me. I'll try to keep it concise. Um, for those of you who weren't, the recording of that meeting is available online. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, watch it, because there's a lot of information in that meeting. That, was, that we're not going over tonight, um, primarily relating to needs that were identified um, based on income and things like that, um, your current housing stock, your current supply of housing. Um, and so, uh, like I said, take a look if you haven't. Um, and then uh, all of those findings will, of course, be included in the report as well. Um, so again, just a little uh, background of why we are here. So uh, this project is part of, um, it's, it's funded through uh, Invest New Hampshire's Housing Opportunity Planning Grant. So the state of New Hampshire committed $100 million of ARPA funds uh, to increase uh, New Hampshire's supply of housing. And so there are funds for capital projects, there are funds, uh, municipal incentive grants, and then there's um, what this bucket is, uh, municipal planning and zoning grants. And that's what um, the, the HOP stands for that you might see, that acronym, um, Housing Opportunity Program. So that's what this process is. And there are um, three phases to the project that the grant supports, and I'll go over those. But it, it, um, it is, uh, includes a housing needs analysis, um, a regulatory audit, and then ultimately regulatory development based on what we learn from the needs assessment and the regulatory audit. So right now, what we've been working on over the past several months is kind of a combination of, of those two. So we've been um, really doing a lot of work on a needs analysis. I'll go over some of the community engagement that's helped inform that. Um, like I said, a lot of those demographic findings and housing stock findings we covered in the first meeting. Um, but there's a lot more to the housing needs analysis as well, some of which we'll talk about tonight. Um, and then the regulatory audit looks at barriers to housing that may exist in your community. So there are a lot of barriers to housing development, right? Um, some of them are in control of your community and many are not. So we're really looking at what is in control of your community um, so that we can move to the final phase, um, which is developing potential um, uh, revisions to your uh, zoning ordinance, subdivision, rules and regulations, site plan review, those sorts of um, aspects of um, your town's regulatory framework that maybe could have some tweaking to facilitate um, housing development. So the project timeline, as I mentioned, phase one and phase two, the needs assessment and regulatory audit. So we've been working on that um, for several months now um, and are really wrapping it up this month. Um, this uh, meeting is kind of the culmination of some of that work. Uh, and then the regulatory development phase, we start that really kind of in July, moving um, through the fall and early winter. Um, and the, the hope is that whatever draft regulations, um, re uh, regulatory amendments uh, come uh, out of this process will go to town meeting in 2024 for your consideration as uh, town meeting voters. So I wanna go over some uh, community engagement takeaways. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of engagement so far. Um, if you haven't really heard much about this project, I encourage you to make sure that your email 
is outside on the sign-up sheet, and we'll make sure you get added to the project list. But I'll also let you know uh, where to find updates about the project if you are not on that mailing list. But so the engagement process so far, um, what we've really kind of we started with uh, community interviews. So. The, um, the housing committee really did a great job of kind of coming up with an initial list of uh, people in the community who either were really knowledgeable about housing needs or um, just had some sort of interest in housing or just would be good people for us to talk to. And so we held um, small group interviews with nearly 40 community members um, at the outset of the, uh, well, a couple months into the project. It, it kind of trickled from March into May, um, just depending on uh, who we were interviewing. Um, we did have the April community meeting um, where there were approximately uh, 45 people in attendance. Um, and after a presentation, um, participants were divided into small groups to answer some questions about housing needs in your community. Um, we then had a community survey uh, that ran for three and a half weeks. It received over 550 responses. We're going to talk a little bit about that survey tonight, not a huge <coughs> amount because, um, you know, we're still. Uh, kind of in the process of talking about the results of that survey with the committee, but the results of that will be posted on the project website as well. Um, and then also in May, um, we had a kind of a, a, a business survey available. One of the things that we kind of wanted to get an understanding of is what are the wages uh, and, and positions available in your community? How many of those jobs, um, especially kind of in, in um, lower wage industries, uh, service industries, may be PSU students versus not. So um, we had um, uh, 10 uh, businesses from a variety of industries responded to that, and it was very informative. Um, and then uh, starting in May and actually still continuing, we are holding an additional round of interviews, but this time really focused on, on barriers. So to be honest, we're, we're talking to a lot of um, uh, developers to get, wow. because they're the ones who build housing, right? So they have a good understanding of looking at a town's regulatory framework and saying, you know, I could make that work, I can't make that work. Um, but so that's where we are right now in the engagement process. So some kind of uh, uh, key takeaways, uh, common themes. Um, we, the community really wanted to talk about underserved population, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about who that is. Um, we also heard a lot about rising housing costs, uh, both just in terms of the actual price points of housing, but also the, um, the, the burden that Plymouth's uh, high property taxes place on homeowners um, and may be prohibitive to people moving to your community. Um, there's a desire for greater housing choice on one side. We heard, we heard quite a bit about that. On the flip side, there's also concern about changing the community's sense of place because there's a lot that people love about Plymouth and people want to make sure that's protected. So it's kind of, you know, uh, it's an exercise in figuring out um, what are the housing needs, what is the town's comfort level with looking at potential changes and ensuring that what makes Plymouth so special is preserved. Uh, we also heard a lot about infrastructure limitations within your community. Um, some of those things, it's really hard for uh, the, the town to do anything about. We can acknowledge them in the needs assessment, but uh, it is, you know, that it's, it's a challenge to come up with the money to, say, uh, fix your network of roads or sidewalks. Um, and those are some of the sorts of things that developers might look at when deciding where to build. So um, we also heard uh, quite a bit about how some of the physical space of the town, um, as well as some of the regulations in place, kind of make it challenging to build in Plymouth. And you'll be able to kind of weigh in on that on two of our stations that I'll talk about. Uh, one really kind of looks at those environmental barriers uh, and kind of allowing that to see like where it might make sense to uh, encourage future housing. And then we also heard about there's varying levels of dissatisfaction or satisfaction uh, with, with town and uh, Plymouth State University relations. So we've heard quite a bit about um, you know, some of the concerns about uh, the just actually, to be honest, the, the large amount of nonprofits in the community and how that can uh, make it uh, challenging to keep property taxes low for taxpayers, um, and PSU being a, a large player in that, but also the um, you know, impacts of uh, student housing um, and, and other things like that. So on the flip side, We've also heard uh, from a lot of people that, you know, a lot of the downtown businesses, it's really, the, those students really support your local economy. 
So it is definitely, we've heard kind of both sides. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about those, those underserved populations that we heard uh, quite a bit about. Um, so across all public engagement activities, several groups have repeatedly come up as people whose needs are not being met by the existing housing market in Plymouth. So low and moderate income workers in Plymouth who cannot afford to live in the town in which they work. Uh, and again, that's not just PSU students. There are a lot of um, lower wage positions in your community, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, that are served by a variety of people, and that there's a significant mismatch between those wages and the housing available. Um, we also heard about really the need for young adults and early career families looking to stay in Plymouth uh, or to move to Plymouth. Um, seniors in need of accessible and affordable housing that will allow them to age in their community. Um, I didn't say age in place because sometimes we hear that seniors want to age in their community, but not necessarily in their current home. They may want to downsize. They may want to move to a place that has you know, more maintenance assistance, things like that. Um, and then also we heard a bit about workers on non-traditional leases, such as uh, visiting nurses who cannot find housing that works for them. So while there's a wide range of housing needs, these are some of the themes that we heard quite a bit about. Um, we also heard uh, about a lot about rising housing costs. And we talked about that at the last community meeting, just how the median sale prices in and around Plymouth have, have risen um, dramatically. And so we've heard a lot of that. Um, however, the high taxes are also the piece of that that we have heard and the strain that puts on current residents and those looking to move to Plymouth. So looking at the survey, um, only 35% of respondents indicated that they could afford the median home price in Plymouth for their household size. So a lot of these, and a lot of these were current residents who said maybe they moved to Plymouth a while ago. Looking at the current median sale prices, they're saying, I couldn't afford to live here. Um, and then there were also uh, about a third of respondents who reported having trouble uh, for uh, paying for housing related costs at least once in the last 12 months. So in, in small group interviews and the April community meeting, um, a lot of people uh, kind of talked about having to move outside of Plymouth to find housing that was affordable to them. Um, another interesting tidbit from the survey, 69% uh, of respondents said that the mismatch between local wages and housing costs was one of the largest challenges that your community is facing. And so again, we'll talk about what that mismatch looks like shortly. Uh, kind of continued on this topic. Across the interviews, the survey, the April community meeting, uh, respondents expressed frustration with the taxes in Plymouth. Um, and that is really tricky to address because this, this housing study is not going to solve that. It can acknowledge it and kind of talk about the relationship between development and property taxes and kind of that push-pull. But uh, it's, it's, it's not going to solve that problem. Um, but many uh, said that taxes were one of the most important factors in their decision on whether to, to move to Plymouth um, and that the discrepancy between taxes and the surrounding locations was a uh, major reason for leaving. Um, and also, um, in particular, we heard a lot about how those high taxes were really concerning for seniors on fixed incomes. So the desire for greater housing choice is interesting because again, as I said previously, it's kind of on the flip side, people really very much caring about protecting what makes Plymouth special. So there's two elements to this. Um, here I'm just gonna talk about the housing choice side. So in Plymouth, we heard a lot, especially in the April community meeting, a lot of great conversations about um, the need for more diversity in the types and prices of housing in Plymouth. Um, with a focus on providing more housing for low and, and middle income households, uh, so-called uh, workforce housing, and we'll, we'll talk about what that means. There's a specific definition we're going to talk about. So um, there was a general consensus that yes, Plymouth uh, needs more housing to meet the needs of current and future residents. That doesn't mean that everybody agrees with that, but it is a kind of common uh, consensus. Um, that also is acknowledged in the current uh, regional needs assessment that um, was recently published. Um, so 58% of survey respondents wanted this housing study to focus on the, um, uh, facilitating the development of housing with a mix of price points, so that pricing, again, being very important to people. 
fewer wanted to see the study focusing on more housing choices in terms of like building types and whatnot. So I think you know, that shows that people are more um, interested in seeing that variation in price as opposed to housing type. But still, almost uh, half of the respondents said they would be interested in seeing more housing options and choices. So um, in the survey, um, single family homes, um, not surprisingly, was what people would like to see more of. We heard a lot about that for smaller single family homes, for especially for you know, young families who might want to move to Plymouth. Um, so we, that's definitely was far and away the, the highest choice. But the second highest um, response was kind of more small, smaller scale, naturally affordable housing, cluster housing that can add more density while preserving open space. Um, so again, single family detached was the most popular housing type over um, uh, half of survey respondents believe that uh, the town lacked both of those housing types. Uh, infrastructure limitations. So that's, that's quite obvious, uh, obviously a hindrance to um, development in Plymouth because it kind of is, you know, potential something that could turn developers away. Um, but it's also just difficult for the people who live in your community already, more importantly. Um, so existing infrastructure limits the ability to develop. Um, so 43% uh, percent of survey respondents cited poor lacking infrastructure as one of the largest housing challenges in Plymouth. Um, and developers talked about that as a, as a major impediment to development as well when we conducted some of those barriers interviews with developers. Um, we heard a lot about the um, desire for better pedestrian infrastructure, especially outside of the downtown. And we also heard quite a bit about parking and the concern, um, especially kind of downtown residents uh, having trouble finding parking um, and overflow of existing parking in some areas. <coughs> Um, and then I, I believe this is the last slide on the community engagement side. There's a, like I said, a desire to make, uh, to protect what makes Plymouth special. So we've heard so much about how amazing your community is, uh, how much people love to live here, the reasons people move to your community, the great schools, just how beautiful it is, your, um, your wonderful uh, village commercial, uh, Main Street, just all of these wonderful reasons that people love Plymouth. Um, and so on that note, um, there were um, about 80% of existing residents who took the survey said it was either very important or somewhat important for them to be able to stay in Plymouth. So that is huge. Um, and then many respondents were proud of being lifelong residents. We, we love hearing you know, people talk about how I've lived in Plymouth my whole life or my family's lived here you know, for multiple generations. People have a strong sense of community pride. Um, that also can be a bit of a barrier to housing creation because it, maintaining that rural character, sometimes there's conflict there with creating um, these additional diverse housing types that people are looking for. Um, and then, so uh, the, the physical space and regulations that are barriers to development. This we heard, again, kind of more probably from the developers, but we did talk quite a bit, some of the groups in the community meeting in April also talked about some of the regulatory barriers, people acknowledging um, that there are some issues with the zoning uh, that potentially make it challenging. Um, so the things that came up frequently in interviews with developers, um, the six, uh, current six unit per building development, um, and then also um, uh, just the, the density requirements. So we're gonna talk about what's allowed in zoning currently uh, within each district and how that can make it hard for a developer to uh, be able to afford um, to build the housing and make any sort of um, you know, positive um, investment. Um, and then also just the lack of developer land in town as a major barrier both in the physical land, but also the amount of land that is currently environmentally protected. And that's hugely important. So that's an example of a barrier that you don't want to change. You want to keep those areas protected. Um, and so, again, that's what I mean by how some barriers the town can address, some it cannot. So that's kind of just a broad overview of what we've heard. Um, I want to go over a little bit about the uh, Plymouth zoning basics, because this might be helpful for your visiting the stations. However, that said, uh, you don't need to memorize this or anything because we will make sure that at the zoning station, if you're interested in it, these topics um, are 
are there. But so this is the zoning map of Plymouth, and the kind of the, the green area that takes up most of the town is the agricultural zoning district. Um, and so what we have on this table here, these are the, just the residential uses. There are all sorts of other res, uh, uses that the zoning talks about, but these are the residential uses um, and what's allowed in each district. So your single uh, family district, your multifamily district, uh, agricultural zone, um, there is um, the civic institutional, uh, village commercial, highway commercial, um, and then the, um, uh, sorry, the in industrial and commercial development. So you can see there's a lot of SEs there, and that means special exception. So that also was identified by some developers as something that makes it maybe a little more challenging to create housing. I mean, even in, in the multifamily district, which is made for encouraging multifamily development, it requires a special exception to build that housing. Um, and then, um, so I think that's the main thing I want to point out. And then just across all districts, the maximum building height being 35 feet. <coughs> Um, again, you do not need to worry about this for purposes of discussion, but what I just want to emphasize here, so these are the minimum lot sizes by zone based on the units and based on whether it's on sewer or uh, septic. And so I guess the, the big takeaway that I would take from this table is this is not a very high density. Um, and to be honest, even in your single family area, those uh, density requirements, you have a whole lot of uh, uh, properties that are already non-conforming. They're already on smaller lot sizes, smaller than half an acre. Um, so it's not just the, the density issue when we're talking about multifamily. It's also that your zoning doesn't even really match up with a lot of what's on the ground <coughs> anyway. So um, the, the housing terminology we want to go over uh, there's a station that will uh, talk about these terms, <coughs> but we just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of uh, confusion about terminology with regard to housing, and I think it makes it difficult to have conversations about it. So we wanted to just go over some of the terms that we're going to talk about, and we just kind of want to have a general consensus about what these mean. So the terms that we're going to be uh, talking about are what, what is market rate housing, what is affordable housing? What is workforce housing? Uh, what are low-income housing tax credit projects? Uh, and what is subsidized housing? And all of these definitions, we're, we're taking directly from um, the state, New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Um, and so that's where these definitions are coming from. And so that's what we want to stick with when we talk about housing. So it's obviously very confusing. And this is very confusing, but we're gonna break it down piece by piece. So this is kind of showing some of the overlap between these, uh, these terms, and we'll talk about them briefly one by one. So still a little confusing, but uh, market rate housing, so that is simply defined as housing that is available on the private market, not subsidized or limited to any uh, specific income level. And again, that's the state's definition of, of what market rate housing is. Affordable housing. So affordable housing is defined by the state as being totally independent of one's income, which is interesting. So affordable housing is defined as housing, whether it's rental or owner occupied, that costs no more than 30% of one's gross income. So rental cost, uh, it's rent plus your utilities and ownership cost, it's uh, your mortgage, um, uh, taxes and insurance. So that's how it's defined. So in other words, someone with a, a what's affordable to someone at one income level may or may not be to someone at a different income level. So the relationship between these two is that you have your market rate housing and, and for, for a lot of people, it may be that they are affordably housed in market rate housing. They are not paying more than 30% of their uh, gross income from all sources uh, to, to housing costs. So there's significant overlap there according to the state of New Hampshire's definitions. Now I want to talk about workforce housing, which is another term we hear a lot of. So um, under New Hampshire law, uh, workforce housing is priced as follows. It's, it's very specific. So rental housing um, is priced as being affordable to a household of three with an income up to 60% of HAMFI, 
uh, which I'll, uh, that stands for household area median family income. And I'll show you what that looks like for Plymouth. Uh, for ownership, it's defined as a household of four with an income up to 100% of that household area median family <coughs> income. So that's how workforce housing is defined in terms of price points. Um, interestingly, the state does not say anything about the actual income levels of the people living in that housing. Um, communities are not required to ensure that it's people at those income levels in the workforce housing, um, but that's, it has to do with the price points of the units. Another important thing to note, workforce housing, it does not include senior housing. And in order for a development to be considered workforce housing, um, a majority of the units have to have uh, at least two bedrooms. So the overlap there, while workforce housing is very specific, 100% of the time it's gonna be considered affordable because that pricing, um, that, that price point is, it's defined by that 30% of um, the income for people at those income levels. Um, and it can cross over with market rate housing. You, I'm sure, have housing in your community that's just naturally already fits that income parameter, which we'll talk about what that looks like both for rent and ownership in a moment. So that's why there's some overlap there. Again, you have some workforce housing, I'm sure, that is market rate and it just naturally fits that. But there's, there's also going to be housing that um, is, is not uh, considered market rate. So now we're gonna kind of talk about some of that, that government assistance that can be tied to housing. So one uh, term, low income housing tax credits. Um, uh, it's a federal program that subsidizes the creation of affordable rental housing, in a nutshell. Uh, for low to moderate income tenants. And developers get a tax credit um, allocation for building this housing. So they must have some or all of the units have to go to tenants at rents below market rate. So this is income restricted. The workforce housing is not, but this, the, the applicants to this housing, their income has to be from all sources at a certain level. Um, and you can see the relationship there. So, um, low income housing tax credit projects can contribute to your workforce housing. They may not necessarily because maybe they are, um, maybe they don't have that uh, two bedroom, enough two bedroom units or something like that. But there's definitely overlap. And the last thing we're gonna talk about is how um, New Hampshire defines subsidized housing. And this is where all or a portion of the uh, occupant's monthly housing cost is paid for directly by the government to the landlord. So it is not income for the person who um, has, say, a housing choice voucher. It's really an, uh, a source of income <laughs> to their landlord. Um, and the renters pay the portion of rent that is determined to be affordable to them. So that's kind of how that, the relationship and the overlap between all these different factors. Oftentimes, low-income housing tax credit projects will have um, tenants with a uh, housing choice voucher living in them, so that's why there's that overlap. Um, one thing that I do want to point out, technically someone with a housing choice voucher could live in market rate housing if um, they found a landlord who was uh, in the private market who was willing to uh, rent to someone with a Section 8 voucher. Um, so I, I promised you that I'd show you kind of what that looks like for Grafton County. Um, so the um, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development publishes income limits each year. And so the reason I have these two highlighted is because they're going to relate to that workforce housing definition that I gave you. And you don't have to take in all these numbers right now um, because I'm gonna just kind of emphasize a couple of them because they're gonna inform the next slide. So you may recall so that for a rental property, you're looking at 60% of the area median income for a family of three. So for your area, that's $54,000 a year. Um, an example of a family that might fit into that, a full-time truck driver, a stay-at-home parent, and one child. This wage data is from the New Hampshire Employment Security um, Office for the, the Plymouth area from 2022. So that's where we're getting those kind of median wages. For ownership, you may recall, it was priced as 100% for a family or a household of four, and that works out currently to um, $100,000 a year. So this is to be considered workforce housing. For your community, that would look like um, a full-time police officer, um, a full-time experienced home health aide, and two children. So that's who would um, that's who that that workforce housing at the ownership level is um, can be priced for. Um, so there is a significant mismatch because the median sale prices for single-family homes in Plymouth, you can see over there, 
do not match with what a family of four with an income of 100% could afford. So that's factoring in, these are the assumptions that we use to calculate that. Not paying more than 30% of your income, so not paying more than 30% of $100,000 a year. Current mortgage rates um, based on, you know, as of a couple days ago, uh, based on uh, Freddie Mac uh, mortgage rates. And then Plymouth's current property tax rate is also applied, which is currently uh, $31.44. So all of that comes together for us to calculate what they could reasonably afford. And there's a mismatch of over $100,000 between the median sales price for a three-bedroom single-family home and what this family could afford. So I just want to highlight those numbers there. So that's the median sales price in 2022. That's what a family of four with an income of 100% could afford in Plymouth. Um, and then that mismatch of over $100,000. Uh, the mismatch for renters. So what we wanted to look at for this was what's called the fair market rents uh, for Grafton County. Um, I will say that those fair market rents are lower than what we see when we look at listings in Plymouth and the surrounding area, but still gives us a good ballpark. So a family of three with an income of 60% could afford a rental payment of just over $1,000 a month. So that's also factoring in not spending more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities um, and spending um, an estimated $200 a month on heat and electricity. That number is from um, New Hampshire Housing Finance. They, they publish what are called um, utility allowances to determine for uh, vouchers um, what the, the rent should be set at, but it's helpful for understanding in general. It's based on a survey of utilities uh, in the area for different housing types and number of bedrooms and so forth. Um, so that's kind of where we got that number. So there is uh, a mismatch of uh, almost $270 a month for, for renters between Again, family of three, say a two bedroom, there is a mismatch there. And it's probably even worse on the ground because again, those Grafton County fair market rents are lower than what we observe for rental listings in Plymouth and the, the county. So I know that's a ton of information. All of that information will be available at the stations as well. So you don't have to have any of that memorized and um, these slides will also be online if there's anything that you're particularly interested in. And of course, all of this will also be included in the, um, the housing, the report that we give to the town. I want to talk about next project steps before we introduce the stations. Um, and the reason is an open house uh, forum such as this, you're, the idea is that you can just leave when you're done visiting. We have five stations. So I want to make sure you're obviously welcome to stay. We'll, we'll convene at the end for anyone who's still here if they have questions. But otherwise, the idea is that you can just head on out. Um, after you finish the stations if you would like. So I'm gonna just go over the next project steps very briefly. So what's coming next? Um, we will have a draft of the needs assessment and barriers analysis for public review later this summer. First, it's gonna go um, you know, to staff and the housing committee, um, but then it'll ultimately be available for public review. And then the project is moving into phase three, which is again, um, developing potential uh, regulatory um, changes um, that the town can consider at town meeting. Um, if you want information about the project, make sure your email is on the sign-in sheet. Um, and then also, the town is so great with the website for this project, um, and it's really easy to find. So if you are on the town website, uh, and they have this handy-dandy projects menu, housing study is the second item there, so it's very easy to find. And Joseph, kudos to Joseph, he's amazing about providing updates for this project. So, and a ton of materials there as well. Um, so that's the next steps, you know, you know what's coming. So again, you, you're welcome to leave after the stations if you would like, but you don't have to because we are happy to reconvene after to go over any questions that you may have. But um, does everyone have one of these agendas? Because this explains the directions for each station. So if you don't have one, I wanna make sure you get one. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So if you look at that, there are five stations. Um, there is a visual preference survey, which is out here kind of to the left. Um, and the kind of general instructions there, the visual preference survey includes uh, four home types um, distributed throughout the exercise. It's a mix of single family homes in the images. They may be standalone, they may be in a subdivision, or they may be in a cluster. Um, there are also images of townhouses, condos, and smaller multifamily buildings that would have no more than six units. And then there are also larger multifamily apartments. Those would not be currently allowed under your zoning, 
Um, and then there's mixed use as well, which is in all of these images, it's depicted as first floor commercial and residential above. So what we're just asking you to do, um, I believe it's Patty, it is. Patty and Brian, awesome. They're gonna be at that station helping you out, but there are green dots, red dots, and yellow dots. And you can pick accordingly. You can put them on every image if you want, but you don't have to. Um, but green means this is appropriate for Plymouth, I like it. And you're not worried about you know, this, the size, we just want you to respond to how it looks, what, if you think it looks appropriate for Plymouth based on scale, um, you know, building materials, design, anything, if, if it resonates with you um, as being appropriate for Plymouth, you can put a green sticker. Red would mean this is not appropriate for Plymouth, I do not like it. And then yellow is, this may be appropriate in some areas, or maybe with some minor adjustments, like I don't like how all the, you know, the clear cutting of trees or, or something. You can, it can be something you like about it, but also, also things you don't. And then they also, we also have a form out there where you can kind of record some of those reasons that you may have put a yellow sticker, like image number seven, I don't like such and such, or this would be really appropriate in this district, but not in this part of town. Um, so you can provide that additional information. So again, that uh, visual preference survey is to the left when you go out. There's also uh, mapping future housing potential right over here. And we have Bruce at this station. And we also have Matt. Yes, so they will be um, at that station. They have stickers showing different housing types, single family, single family cluster, townhouses and condos, uh, apartments, and then mixed use. And you can um, uh, talk with them about making sure you understand how to read the map, but you can place those um, stickers for different housing types where you think they may be appropriate uh, in, in your community. Um, and then uh, master plan recommendations, that's outside where there are uh, uh, master plan recommendations from the 2018 master plan, which you may or may not be familiar with. But we took select recommendations relating to housing and put them on a chart. Uh, and um, Rebecca, Rebecca Hansen from the planning board, she's going to be at that station uh, explaining the directions. But there are just dot stickers where you can indicate your level of agreement with those recommendations if they are still applicable. Um, and then revisiting Plymouth zoning, that's also in here. Um, so at this station, I believe we have John and we have Will. Um, and that is really, we have sticky notes, a big giant zoning map. I'm gonna put up um, some of those uh, zoning parameters on the slides again, um, if that helps guide the discussion. But you're just leaving sticky notes about areas where you think, hey, maybe the town could look at changing zoning in this district, or maybe uh, a new district in this area might make sense. Um, so that's all just sticky notes over there <coughs> on this map. Um, and then lastly, what is affordable and to whom? So that's really focusing on a lot of those definitions. Um, and that station is right up there. And at that station, we will have Mike, Mike, and Sue. Awesome. And then I'll also be um, at that station, uh, just because a lot of those definitions are pretty complex if people have questions. Um, but uh, that's all five stations. Um, you do not have to go to all of them. You can just go to the ones that interest you. Uh, but you know, we encourage you to. Um, and then also, um, you, yeah, you do not need to visit all stations, and uh, we ask that you, you don't need to go in any order. If you see a group has a lot of people, go to a different group, and you know, just kind of, just, it's an open house. So go where you would like, uh, but just try to be mindful of crowds at different groups. Um, and again, if you have any questions, you can look for people with uh, name tags, and we'd be happy to help you. All right, any questions about the stations or where to go? Yes. I just wanted to me mention that if they leave early, the exit board. Oh, thank you so much, Patty. You were awesome. <laughs> so we do have an exit board question right by that door. Uh, it just, oh, looks like it's fallen. I'll fix that. Um, but it is just asking, is there anything that we missed in this presentation and the questions we're asking that you think is really important for this study? And there are sticky notes right on that table. Uh, you can just throw your thoughts on that if you have any that you'd like to share with us. Thank you very much, Patty. Um, all right. So go where your interest takes you. <clears throat> or comments before we break up for the evening? I think 
think the follow on for this is, <laughs> is a recent yeah. study. James does, we are just a dot in the middle of a bigger, of a bigger, um, um, of a bigger area. Well, I, I, to speak to that, yeah. the Lakes Region <coughs> Planning Commission and all the local planning commissions right now in, in New Hampshire um, are doing their own regional studies. Mm -hmm. They're a bit more of a kind of flyover with kind of abstract numbers as opposed to the kind of level of engagement we can do in one town. Right. Um, but some of the, I believe some of the data is being pulled in the regional studies. Mm -hmm. And um, so it does kind of fit into the broader regional studies that are, that are happening right now. Right. Actually, they're being, they just happened, they're being finalized right now. And so for instance, you know, do we need staff, do we need workforce housing? I mean, legally everyone's supposed to have, have their fair share. Right, right, right now, basically, yeah. all the workforce, how all the workforce is coming from, you know, do a survey of the Walmart workers and see where they all come from, the main, how far they come mm -hmm. for, you know? Well, I guess one of the questions is, can more of them, or do more of them want to live in town, uh, well, lo locally rather than commuting? And But you understand, of course, that the further away you live, the cheaper the housing yeah. is, but the more expensive the transportation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've got a, like a complete, <coughs> you've got a complete yeah. neutrality. Well, and the it's the transportation for the individual as well as the maintenance of the infrastructure for the transportation. Both, yeah. And who pays for it? That's the, and so it's the state's paying for it versus the town. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you, and thank you especially to our uh, planning. Still there. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Well, don't get them going. <laughs> I would like to see maybe in the future about uh, that single family zone and what is uh, buildable under our existing ordinance as far as Great Point and water and sewer from the town because there are limitations on both and that would reduce the volume of the area of that zone substantially. Or shrinking in some of the others you're talking about. In other words, land, that looks like we have a lot of land to work with, but most of it's just we're looking at mm -hmm. because okay. of its configuration. So that, All right, thank you. One other thing that um, and we have this slide about barriers, and you see the condition of the road, and, and then you keep in, the roads are tough because it's, it's a lot of money, and I don't blame the highway department. I think they're doing an incredible job. But you see um, it's stressed already what they're trying to take care of, and if someone comes in with a development and they've got more roads, they've already seen what's happened to a past developer who wasn't allowed to have their roads taken over by the town and what they're going through the ringer now. Um, yeah, it's just a lot of barriers to development, and uh, I can understand the developer saying, you know, if you want us to come to Plymouth, you've got to make this easier for us. So I get that slot. Thank you. So the, the elephant in the room is, you know, like how many kids is it going to come to town? How many what? How many kids? The road, hopefully a lot. Well, the development, right? The residential development. <coughs> well, hopefully they turn 16 and get a job. Well, yeah, but that's too local. Jim. You know, <laughs> that is still the elephant, right? Well, so, right. well, they won't be kids forever. Okay. We've got to use language. Space <laughs> utilization of the school system is can't, not You can't up base housing percent. decisions on who's going to live in the housing. Yes. Uh, sorry, what? You can't base housing policy decisions on who's going to live in the housing. No, you have to address that directly at, with our taxation system. That, that may be, but they're separate issues. I know. <laughs> I'd like to go join them. The, uh, <laughs> uh, and I know, I know it's not your job. But. Any other questions or comments? I'm excited about the next phase that we're going into. Very excited. So. All right. Make it a motion uh, <coughs> to adjourn. Second. 